Thank you for looking right. Uh, you rattle off a batch of or a batch of uh, awards that you've won to rattle off. Uh, you made very clear that the one from Romain was important. How significant to you are the rest of those awards? What do they what do they mean to you? They mean a lot less on a personal level than they do for the restaurant. And when I say the restaurant, I mean every person that makes up Alinea. So now we have 67 employees at that restaurant. And at this point, we're doing about the same amount of diners a night. So we almost have a one-to-one -one ratio. So what do the accolades do? I mean, from a business point of view, any accolade is good for the profitability and, and the overall business, putting people in the seat. So when we, when we won uh, Best Restaurant in North America, number seven in the world from Restaurant Magazine, our web server crashed and our phone lines went dead from an overwhelming demand of both web traffic and phone calls. Um, that's important because we need customers in order to pay the employees, and the employees recognize that. On a personal level, I think it's the achieving, it's, it's, it's that putting that goal out there, having something to chase. And a similar question came in from the San Francisco Chronicle yesterday, and they said, you know, what does Michelin three stars mean? What does being best in North America mean? The day that you win, the day that Jean-Luc uh, Jean Noiré calls you and says you've been awarded three Michelin stars, you go, wow, that's great, and you have a toast with your staff. And then all of a sudden you realize that it's everything leading up to getting the three stars that's really important. And it's chasing it down, and that's kind of like the title of the book. Um, it's that pursuit, it's that, that passion of getting there that's more important than actually getting it. And I think the entire staff drinks that Kool-Aid, and it's really important, really important to them. I'd just like to know what's your uh, favorite food to eat, and has it changed over time? Uh, I like pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, there's not much that I don't like. Uh, we, my girlfriend and I have been to Japan twice recently, and we love Japanese food, I love Thai food, Vietnamese food. Um, you know, there's really not a whole lot that I don't like. It's really all out there. There's some things that I have a little bit more difficulty eating now. Anything that's really spicy becomes a bit of a challenge for me. Um, anything super sick is a, a bit of a challenge, but really, I, it's tough for me to pick a favorite. Yeah? Um, my question's actually for you, Nick. So you will not. He's <laughs> a very passionate chef that you're dealing with, but he wants to be able to create a business. Um, how is telling him no? Have you ever had to tell him? I don't him think, I mean, we, we, we discuss a lot of things, <laughs> argue them, I guess. He's but, smirking a lot. Well, I mean, look, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, there's a lot of times where I'll say, like, that seems unnecessary or something like that. And, and then, you know, he'll go, this is why it's necessary. And, you know, if you really are striving to have the best possible restaurant, there's always a trade-off between, I think a lot of businesses try to maximize profitability at the cost of everything else, and you end up losing sight of what got you there to begin with. And I think that we have a good give and take to understand that trying to maximize a dollar is not what Linnea is about. Um, you know, it's made money every quarter we've been in operation. It is a successful business. Um, it makes money, but we're also ch ch trying to achieve other goals. And um, it's just about finding that balance. I mean, we spend six and a half thousand dollars a month on liquid nitrogen. In my opinion, they can freeze less things. <laughs> <laughs> but the frozen stuff is really good right now. Right? So, uh, you know, so, but we, we do have those discussions. And you know what? Like, what, what's interesting at Olivia, I think, is that everyone puts people into very specific roles and grants the chef and I'm the business guy and all that, but it, you know, he can, he's mean on a spreadsheet, he can, he can do all of that as well. And uh, I've had one or two maybe culinary ideas. And so you end up with- good ideas? Well, <laughs> not allowed to say.
But we don't, you know, I think that what I'm saying is it's a very creative environment to work in and we're not big on titles. And so it just becomes a collaborative, a collaborative thing, a really good place to, to work, really. I promised him next. Um, what is it about the Chicago culinary landscape that, you know, keeps you here? Like you said, um, you know, you were thinking about going to New York to open a new restaurant. Like, what keeps you around? Like, what is it that, about Chicago that does it for you? Well, I think the fact that when I landed at Trio in 2001, if you think back to what restaurants were really um, making a mark in this style of cooking, there were very, very few. So that was kind of pre the whole molecular gastronomy boom. And, you know, uh, El Bulli was certainly becoming popular, but didn't really, really hit it until 2003, 2004. Um, Fat Duck was, had been around for a while, but wasn't, again, it, it just wasn't buzzing at that time. Especially in this country, WD-50 wasn't open, um, Moto wasn't open, even in New York, uh, I think the only restaurant that you could maybe even consider cooking in that genre was when Paul Lee Brat was at um, Papillon. Papillon, and what was the one before that? Atlas. He got three stars from <laughs> Atlas, right. So there wasn't a whole lot going on in the country in terms of like uber progressive cuisine. I landed here in 2001. By 2002, Trio was churning out some pretty wacky stuff. And everybody in the community, both the diners and the local media, were behind us 100%. And I can't say that that would be the case in New York or San Francisco or LA. So at that point, you recognize that you have a very, you have an audience that's behind you, both publicly and the media. What better place to be? cooking the way we cook. Nowhere. Nowhere. So at that point, don't leave. We've uh, we got time for one more question. One more question. Right in the red. Um, I can dazzle by your food, but I'm also very, very intrigued by the presentation. And I'm curious, in the development process, as you're conceiving a new dish, how do you Well, since 2002, we've been collaborating with Martin Kastner of Crucial Detail Design Studio. Uh, he's a kind of a master of all and wears many hats for us. He designed our website, our logo. He laid out the Alinea cookbook graphically. He creates all the special serviceware that we use at the restaurant. So it can go either way. Either Martin will come to me with an idea for a way to present food, like literally an entirely new object for us to play with and manipulate food around, or we'll come to Martin with a problem, basically, and say, look, I have this uh, tiny, thin, delicate strip of bacon. When I lie it on a plate, the butterscotch sticks to the plate and you can't peel it off. You know how when you, sometimes when you lay a piece of paper on a table, it's hard to pick it up, and you, your fingers can't get under it. I have all these problems, what can we do? And so he'll come up with a design based around the properties of the food. So it can really go either way. Amazing stuff. Thank you all for being here. I think, uh